Welcome to the broadcast project of the 66 Books Ministry. Pray with me, please. Father, in this first month of the year, where the weeks of our journey seem to spread so very long before us, help us to count the cost of our following you and to pay the price of our passion to run in such a way that we might please you forever and ever. Amen. And let it be so. Our vision is to take the gospel of Jesus to the 66 most influential cities of the 250 nations of the world. That's 16,500 cities. Want to help? Then go to give66.com. Write to us at the 66 Books Ministry, 96 Craig Street, Suite 166, LJ, Georgia, 30540. Or call us toll free on 855-66-BUCKS. That's 855-66-26657. Well, hello there. It's Victor Robert Farrell here again. It's great to have you listening to this broadcast project of the 66 Books Ministry, where, as a global missions organization, we're continuing to get the raw word out to real people. We're proclaiming Jesus, the Savior of the whole world, from the whole Bible, because he's wonderful. The 66 Cities Project of the 66 Books Ministry is a 21st century global back-to-the-Bible movement, and we need your help. In 2015, our 66 Cities Project is happening in the USA, where we shall be preaching from each of the 66 books of the Bible in the 66 most influential cities of the country. There are three big reasons we are doing this. First, to take the preached Bible out into the marketplace. Second, to show that the raw Bible is for real people. Third, to show that each of the 66 books has a message about Jesus that is for right now and for right here in the United States of America. We believe that we are here for such a time as this. Go to www.give66.com right now and help us to once more take the God of the Bible to the people of America. Well, thank you, Aaron, for highlighting our 2015 tour of the USA, which, as you all know, do you know this? It will become an annual tour year on year thereafter. Now, I don't want to pass over this too quickly, but just to remind you, friends, that this is the year that we at the 66 Books Ministry are pouring concrete into our foundations, and we're in great need of an additional 250 supporters who will contribute just $20 per month. That's $5 a week, remember. So can we ask you to really consider this? And if God moves in your heart to help us in this ministry, then please just go to give66.com. That's give66.com and become one of our much-needed new financial supporters. Don't forget now, just $5 a week will really help us. Well, for the next couple of days, myself and my wife were in Northern Ireland, and Belfast in particular, meeting with the U.S. consulate over there, trying to sort out our official visa for the USA. Trying to do things legally in America, you know, does have its drawbacks. It's very, very difficult. All that documentation is enough to get you down. It's quite a challenge for me, that's for sure. So, we're asking for your prayers today and tomorrow in particular, that we would find favour with all men. So, this year we're asking that you'll pray for us, that God would provide us with favour with all men, and that he would also send us these concrete trucks to help us pour some very deep foundations into the ministry. A word to all of our friends in the USA, finally, we're praying for your safety in the middle of your polar vortex. My goodness, that looks far too cold for me. So, anyway, I think Aaron's got one more thing to say to you. We also send out an almost daily newsletter. So if you want to receive our almost daily news and pray for us on a daily basis, then please just sign on up to this broadcast channel and it will be with you tomorrow and almost every day thereafter. Okay, so let's get to it then. A soldier, a peacekeeper, somewhere in a worn, torn country, gingerly makes his way through the blackened shell of a now grotesquely gutted house. The quietness and the too familiar smell hits him as he approaches the cracked open door of the inner room. Rifle at the ready, he slips in and beholds the carnage. Before the small child's remains, his very being crumples like pressed paper. And from his angry mouth slips the word, Oh, Jesus. 
The house seemed empty. Her fiftieth birthday, and no one had remembered. The children had flew the coop years ago, and were now across country far, far away, taking care of their own families and business. He had taken their red coupe, all their savings, found a younger model, and after thirty years of marriage, was taking care of the other woman's family now. No one, it seemed, cared for her. The Sunday school had helped, and the pills, some, but there seemed nothing that could take away the pain of returning to an empty house, an empty bed. She flicked the switch, and the roar of the word hit her. Surprise! Leaping up from behind the furniture, underneath balloons and banners and falling streamers, were the happy faces of her children, her grandchildren, and her dearest friends. Faces full of care now filled the aching void of her tired mind. She lifted her hands and pressed her shaking fingers to her cheeks, cupping her astonished jaw, and out slipped the wondrous words, Oh, Jesus! The x-rays were not clear. The mass was visible even to the untrained eye. The doctor's words echoed in the distance and seemed to be heard from an unreal and an other place. I'm so sorry. We'll do all we can, of course, but... Staring straight ahead, his astonished facial muscles were fixed in unbelief. Yet his mouth still moved and out slipped the words again. Oh, Jesus... Not far away in another building, a brand new father is given a tiny bundle. His wife lays exhausted, sweaty, and smiling on the bed before him. But in the blanket wriggles a new life, full of energy. Things will never be the same again. With two fingers, he gently pulls back the blanket and reveals the new pink flesh, the damp black hair, and the palest, bluest eyes. He shakes his head and tastes the salty tear that has rolled down his cheek and slipped into the corner of his smile. With a sigh, he says, Oh, Jesus! To his dearly beloved, to his chosen children, his name alone is a prayer poured forth. The new man, the hidden heart, moved by the Holy One indwelling us, takes his wonderful name, and whether birthed upon our lips in anger, in despair, or in happiness or thankfulness, takes that saving name, and be it from our mountain tops of exultation, or our darkest morgues of mourning, sets it in its many shades of clear and spoken colours, carefully shaping it into pleading petitions, arrows of thankfulness, cries for mercy, calls for help, courage, clarity or closeness, and then gently lays them before the mighty throne of God Most High. O oh, Jesus, O oh, Jesus, O oh, Jesus, listen. Your name is ointment poured forth. Song of Songs 1 verse 3 Pray with me, please. Lord, when words are not enough, let me find your name alone to be more than enough. Oh, Jesus, 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 Amen. And we've been looking at the uh, words and the works of Jesus, the Messiah. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at pearls and priceless objects. Pearls and priceless objects. Our opening text is found in Matthew chapter 13. If you could please turn there in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 13. And we read as follows. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. For joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth 
separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure new and old. Pray with me, please. Father of delights, it's before your throne of grace right now, that's where we are, that we ask you to help us to sharpen our swords of truth, anoint our shields of faith, refit the helmet of our salvation. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that the word of the Lord may become for us the pleasure ground of our mind, the comfort of our soul, the healer of our body, the quickener of our spirit, and the rock upon which we stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, I came home yesterday to find my wife multitasking. So it was a shock for a husband to find his wife multitasking. She lay on the couch with the television in the corner turned on, and on her lap was a computer running BBC iPlayer. And while the TV had the sound turned down, the iPlayer was turned up. On the television it was a fat-faced Contessa, I think that's her name, and she was cooking up some indescribable delicacy for her PC friends and uh, her gay entourage. And Bridget had on her lap her other favourite programme, this time with the volume turned very, very high, and her little pupils were expanding and contracting as she stared into the corner at her cookery programme and then back to the laptop where she was watching her other favourite personal treasure programme. Uh, you know what that treasure program is I'm talking about, don't you? It's, uh, do you know it? It's the Antiques Roadshow, of course. The Antiques Roadshow. Well, you know, I am the subject in my home of the double jeopardy of cookery and treasure hunt programs being shown at the same time. Because my wife's deep desire is to find in some little antique shop tucked in the back of a small village somewhere, or at some Church of England jumble sale, or some car boot bonanza, nothing short of lost treasure. Some little angel sent from heaven carrying a pot of gold for her. Of course, the Antiques Roadshow's greatest find was a, a maquette of the scale model of the Angel of the North. Surprisingly valued at the time, because it's only something like seven feet high, so, uh, uh, one million pounds. Can we say that together? One million pounds! That was the most expensive thing on the Antiques Roadshow. Treasure hunting got me thinking, you know. Uh, I must admit that with our virtually non-existent summer last year and our very, very long winter this year, I've been longing for the sunshine of South Florida. Oh, yeah. Mine and Bridget's, we used to walk along that place there, that's Hollywood Boulevard, just down the road from where we live, and, and we just used to love all those white sands and the warmest of blue seas. We'd wait until the crowds of Canadian French-speaking snowbirds in February and March, and all those old Eastern Bloc, hairy, greasy, speedo-wearing men, with the tightest of pants you could ever imagine. We'd wait until they'd all gone home before we took our evening stroll. It was about this time of year, really not too many years ago, when we came upon a treasure hunter on that very same beach there. He was scanning in front of him with this quite large metal, metal detector. I stopped him, as you do. I stop everybody when they look as though they're doing something interesting. And I engaged him in conversation. I wanted to know, you know, do you make a lot of money doing this on the beach in the evening, scanning for lost treasure? What on earth can you find? He says, well, I make enough to keep coming back year after year. I've been doing this for years. I said, what do you do? He said, well, I wait until everybody goes home, and then I search for all their lost rings that have fallen off their fingers because of the slippery suntan oil, all of the forgotten watches that they put under their towel, all the other things that have slipped from their earrings and that, and I, I actually scavenge for them. Cheeky. Cheeky, I thought. 
like a gannet, getting everything that everybody's lost. I make enough to come back every year, though. I know Bridget wants to get a metal detector as well, and why not? It's less than a year ago when Mr. Terry Herbert went out with his detector, just July 2009, and he discovered in a field, this very field here, not far from Birmingham, what has become known as the Staffordshire Hoard, a priceless pile of 7th century Anglo-Saxon royal treasure of swords and crosses and stuff like that, all in various sizes, encrusted with jewellery, which is now today valued at 3.3 million pounds. 3.3 million pounds. One of those folded crosses is marked in Latin with some words from the scriptures, probably from Numbers 10 verse 35, indicating that these very self-same items once belonged to Christian warriors, maybe. Rise up, O Lord, and may your enemies be dispersed, and those who hate you be driven from your face. How about that to find in a field somewhere? There's a fundraising battle going on at the moment to stop these very same treasures being taken to the British Museum in London, to keep them in the potteries, as it were. So far, they've raised a million pounds. A million pounds! On the internet. Click here. Pay now if you want to keep them in Staffordshire. And we're in a recession. It makes you think, doesn't it? Treasure. You see, people want it. Treasure. You see, people want to keep it. And we all want to find treasure, don't we? Whether it's an idea treasure, you know, a secret idea to make me millions. I had a friend of mine, he'd got this idea for a new plastic water bottle for hikers to use. It took me four months to get the design out of him. It was rubbish. But he thought it was a treasure that he could make a lot of money on there. Design treasure we want. That's why we've got the whole patenting uh, legal side of things in this country. Make an invention, patent it, and it's yours for the next 20 years. Business treasure, which is why we copyright everything, to protect that physical expression of ideas. Treasure, you see, takes on a personal imperative. It's, it's mine. Well, why? Because treasure changes things. Treasure compensates. Treasure elevates. Treasure educates, treasure invigorates, treasure frees you up a little bit. Wouldn't it be great to be a secret millionaire? Have you ever watched that program? Fantastic! All those people with loads of millions of pounds that are able to disguise themselves and just give away hundreds of thousands to their favourite causes. It's very exciting, isn't it? Rescuing people like some financial scarlet pimpernel from the financial guillotine and letting them start afresh and empowered. Imagine having more than enough money to do what you wanted to do for yourself and other people. You see, there is value in treasure. Bridget used to call me treasure, you know. Yeah. All the friends used to say, where would you dig it up from then? <laughs> She doesn't call me treasure anymore, she calls me. Well, I won't tell you, because it won't embarrass me. We all want to find treasure, don't we? From Alexander Dumas, in The Count of Monte Cristo, one of my favourite uh, books and films, to Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, we're all familiar with, Humphrey Bogart's The Maltese Falcon, even to Nicolas Cage, their national treasure, right from the X Factor to discover somebody with a great gift and talent to the national lottery on the weekend. We're all seeking and hoping to find treasure. I remember when I found my first treasure. Oh yeah, I did. I was at Bible College, early 1980s. It was at Scarfing Books in Cromford. I used to go and collect some pasties for lunch and I'd stop in this bookshop. It's still there. And on the shelf in the religious section was a whole whacking volume set of Matthew Henry's Bible commentaries. Fantastic. A pound. I went to the counter and I said, nonchalantly, is this a pound each? Or a pound for the whole seven volumes? He said dismissively, oh, you can have a lot for a pound. I tell you, I nearly gave myself a tennis elbow getting my pound out of my pocket. And it was only when he saw how quickly I went for my wallet that he realised that he'd given away something for nothing. He did. Something for nothing. 
I imagine an antique expert going into a store in Hastings, maybe, and he sees a Ming dynasty plate hanging there on the wall. He takes it down, he looks at it, he puts it back up a little bit, and then, uh, you know, he, he, he wanders around the store and he sees a pair of those old brass shire horse things, and he, he says, ah, how much are these? Seven pounds? Seven pounds each for both of them. Have you take any less? No? Seven pounds for both. Okay. He goes over here and he finds a, a Huntley and Palmer's biscuit tin. How much is this? He says, ten pounds. We accept seven. Eight, eight, nine pounds. I'll take that then. And then he says, uh, I wonder if you've got anything else. And he steps back and he says, this whole thing here, how much? Five pounds. I'll take it, he says. And he goes and he buys the Huntley and Palmer's biscuit tin, the Shire Horse brasses and he says my goodness you struck a hard bargain on those two I'll give you a five pound for this no problem at all and then the antiques dealer takes that Ming dynasty plate hanging there for five pound and he sells it for five hundred thousand pounds imagine a man with a metal detector finding some treasure in a field it's a cold wet February it's sleeting down he's freezing his fingers are blue he's just thinking of going off home and just as he's he's about to pack it in that metal detector it, it goes off and so one more time he digs and he finds something he, he wipes the mud off and he says wait a minute he says and he bites it and he tastes it he says I think this is gold I think it's gold and he scans another one meter circumference around and there's more it's going off all over the place and now some miraculous thing has happened in his hands he doesn't feel the cold anymore and after a couple of hours in that one meter circumference circle he's dug and uh, maybe put seven items in his pocket all uh, covered in mud and that but he's very excited and another scan on a wider circumference there finds out there's even more there to be discovered so for the first time now he looks up, he looks around, he makes sure nobody can see what he's doing in this field. It's a cold, wet, February sleeting. He is the only person in that field, but he wants to make sure that there's nobody else. So he replaces the dirt, he covers it over where he's been, and he marks it. Not right there, mind you, but he goes to the side of the field, he gets his little knife out, and he puts two diagonal scratches in a piece of wood, that when you put down your head like this and look, it points to where the treasure is. So he's going to remember it when he gets back there. As he's walking home with his uh, detector on his back there, Jack comes down the road and says, How are you doing, Fred? He says, I'm fine, thanks. Where have you been today? Oh, he says, I've just been around. Did you find anything? Oh, I wish. Where are you going next? Oh, I'll tell you what, I can't stay and talk. I've really, I've really got to go. And he hurries off home. He needs to tell somebody, his wife, about his treasure. He gets in the house. He's already three hours late. She's already put the dinner in the dog. He says, don't worry, darling. He sits her down. She's complaining about the mud on the carpet, the mud on his hands. But he's really excited. And he puts his hand in his pocket and he takes out these seven things. And he puts them gently down on the table. He says, look at that. What's that? She says. And he begins to put dirt all over the tablecloth. But she doesn't mind, because she can see that they're very expensive items. The phone rings, and they leave it. The door is not, and they ignore it. After a couple of hours, he goes upstairs for the quickest bath you can ever imagine, and he takes with him one of these large pieces, and he bathes with it. He doesn't wash it, he doesn't scrub it, he bathes with it. Sits in the bath, hot soapy water, and he washes all the rubbish off. And he sees just how majestic this treasure is. He comes down to his wife and he says to her, Darling, how much we got? She says, Not a lot. He says, We need to buy that field. We've got to keep quiet about it, play it cool. I can't go back there again. I don't want to be seen. If I do go back there, it's probably going to have to be at night time. Yes, at night. But meanwhile, darling, let's find out how much that feels cost. Let's pay an independent person to actually go and make an offer to the farmer. You see, I've got a plan. Always come up with a plan when you sit in the bath. Did you know that? I've got a plan, he says. 
We need to pretend that we're property developers buying that. We'll offer more than he'll accept for it, rather expect for it, so he'll buy it. Yes, he'll sell it. So two weeks later, after they've gone through all the rigmarole, the agent comes back to them and he says, uh, how much? And he finds out how much the farmer wants. He goes home to his wife. She says, how much for the field, darling? He says, more than you could ever imagine. Darling, he says, we can't just mortgage the house. We've got to sell it completely. You know that uh, webuyanycar.com? We need to sell both of our cars on webuyanycar.com. Get all your jewellery. Let's take our wedding rings and go to cashforgold.com. Let's go and see the kids and see if we can get a loan. In addition to that, you know your blood? You've got more than enough blood. We're going to sell some blood. We're going to sell some plasma. We're selling everything. We're going to live at the local travel lodge for £19.99 per night for as long as it takes because we need to get everything to buy that field. And he buys the field. He finds the hoard, he knows there's much more to be found, but he's got enough in his pocket. He goes down to the British Museum because he needs help now. He says, I want to see the curator for Anglo-Saxon treasure. And the receptionist says, I'm so sorry, he's very busy. He takes it out of his pocket, he slams it down on the table, he says, take that to him. All of a sudden, he's miraculously not busy. (laughs) They remain anonymous. They get the treasure. Forty million pounds! Sorry, left terrorists, but they buy a Greek island that the government's selling off at the moment. And they live in secluded security and are pampered for the rest of their lives. Treasure will make you think like that, won't it? Treasure will make you act like that. Jesus is not justifying or commenting on the morality of the smoke and mirrors of treasure hunting or treasure transaction no he's not doing that he's taking hyperbole and he's talking about the passion of possession and make no bones about it the passion of possession has its price we're going to join Jesus now and I need to tell you that there's been a profound change in the offer of the coming kingdom to Israel. The problem is an easy one to see. The kingdom that Jesus was offering to the Jewish people was not the kingdom that they expected. It wasn't the Messiah that they had uh, hoped for. His zeal for God and his passion for purity seemed to them to verge on the very edge of insanity. His mighty miracles that he did were totally unquestionable, but the source of the power of those miracles was under question. So much so that we read in Mark 3 verse 21. When his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He's out of his mind! And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub... And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Now, really, from this point on, most commentators agree that the nation of Israel has thoroughly rejected Christ and his kingdom. And the leaders, and soon the nation, would regard Jesus not just as a madman, not just as a very bad man, but rather they would regard him as the incarnation of Lucifer. Everything that Jesus said and did would be, in their mind, opposite to the will and the kingdom of God. He casts out demons and does miracles in the name of Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies, the prince of demons. Jesus tries to counteract them. He tries to be very merciful with them. And he says, look, a kingdom divided itself against itself cannot stand. Of course I'm not doing these things in the power of the devil. He says to them, even Israel, even you as a nation have got your own exorcists and you praise God for the work that they do. Jesus says this to them, a robber entering a house must be strong enough to overpower the armed guard. I'm strong enough to overpower the enemy. Now, the clarion call to hear and obey comes from Jesus. 
to trust in his words and his person. All that had already gone out. It was the groundwork of all his proclamation. Trust and obey. Have faith and believe. Repent of your sins. Indeed, doesn't Jesus say this in Matthew 7, verse 24? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it didn't fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, well, they're like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came up, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You see, Christ was doing the work of the Father. In all things he'd been validated by the Father. And now Israel had rejected the word of the Son, Israel had rejected the word of the Father, and finally now they were going to reject the word of the Holy Spirit. And the word of the Holy Spirit was in conviction, signs, wonders, and miracles. And now they said, this is not God, this is the devil who is the source of this power. And when you do that, when you reject the word of the Son, the word of the Father... The word of the Holy Spirit, there's nowhere else to go. Nowhere but hardness of heart, blindness of eyes, and unalterable unforgiveness. Once the rejection of the Holy Spirit's work was complete, a ziplock seal on that most unsavory smell was pulled across Israel's heart and mouth and remains there even today. That's why... Jesus in Mark, verse three twenty-eight says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Now, when they accused Jesus of doing miracles in the power of Beelzebub, and being therefore the incarnation of Lucifer, there was no going back. Israel had rejected their Messiah. Now then, Christ turns to describing something old and something new, something different, something not seen, something not contemplated yet in the minds of men and women, a manifestation of the kingdom of God that now needed an explanation. So Jesus begins speaking in parables now, in a most substantial way. And the question is posed to him by his disciples in Matthew 13, verse 10. Why do you speak in parables all the time now? Why do you speak in parables? And he replies in verse 11, Because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it's not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then, in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. Seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people has grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes. Hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see. And your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Friends, a parable is a literary device where you teach by transference. In other words, you take a picture from the known realm, and you transfer it to the un unknown realm. Uh, a simple uh, metaphor, really. Remember, Jesus said, I am the gate. Well, as soon as he says that, because you know what a gate is, what it looks like, what it does, you can transfer that picture from the known realm, I am the gate, into the spiritual realm. And in the unknown spiritual realm, you can understand how Jesus is the access to all of God's pasture. A parable is a true life story 
with historical roots, illustrating one main principle, even though it might highlight a number of other, others. Parables have got context, historical context, the context of the culture that it's set in. And Jesus is now faced with a mixed multitude of people. People who believe, and people that don't believe. People that have accepted, and many people that have rejected. And for those that had rejected him, he had no more to say to them. He didn't separate the believers and the non-believers. He just stopped speaking to non-believers. To understand a parable, you've got to understand and know the historical context with what Jesus was dealing with. Here's the key to what he's going to speak about. Matthew 13, 11. He answered and said to them, Why am I speaking in parables? Why? Because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not been given. He spoke in parables to convey truth regarding the coming kingdom, the kingdom of God in its present form, in its new form, in its not yet revealed form. The Old Testament prophets have proclaimed that Christ would come. They proclaimed that Christ would forgive sins, that he would deliver them from their enemies, establish a kingdom rule as existence would be in peace and righteousness. And Jesus himself had proclaimed this when he said constantly, the kingdom of God is near, it's come. It was always on his lips, but now they'd rejected Christ and his kingdom. Now there were no more hosannas, there was no throne for Jesus to come to. Now Jesus turned his face to Jerusalem and to the cross and to this eventual, indescribable statement in Matthew 21, verse 42. Listen. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. You see, in the future, God will fulfill his word regarding the nation of Israel. There will be a literal millennial kingdom. There will. God is faithful to his word. He's got to do this. But for now, in this age, for the last 2,000 years, the kingdom has taken a different form. And from Matthew 13 onwards, the description of this kingdom extends from Israel's rejection of the Messiah to Israel's acceptance of Jesus, the Messiah, in the future. Please God, the near future. So, following this rejection now, Jesus has nine parables which describes the form of the kingdom in this present age. Listen please, church. The first one you know is the sowing of seed by sowers. This kingdom at the moment will be... uh, Grown by the sowing of seeds by sowers into people's hearts by the hearing of the word of God. The second parable is that he's teaching us that there's life in the seed. It's not just our responsibility to make things grow. We're simply the sowers of the seed. The seed itself contains life in it. It's special. Jesus tells us that in the second parable. Thirdly, he teaches about the seed growing amongst thorns. There's going to be tares amongst the wheat. There will be a mixed multitude in the church at large and in local churches as well. Fourthly, he talks about the parable of the mustard seed. That it will be a very small, imperceptible thing that will eventually grow into something large and enormous covering the earth. That's what the kingdom will be like, says Jesus. Fifthly, he says that the kingdom is going to have this internal force of growth. It won't be by external conquering of armies. Jesus gives this parable saying it will be like yeast in bread. It will spread throughout the whole thing. The power will be in itself. It will permeate the whole. And it will grow. Sower of the seed, we know is God the Son, essentially. The seed is the word of God. The field, we know, is the world. Believers, we know, are the wheat. 
Non-believers are the tares, all growing together until there's an eventual harvest of separation and judgment. And now, friends, we come to parable number six and parable number seven. Are we ready now? What do they mean? These treasures of land and these treasures of sea. It's very simple. Let's read it, shall we? Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field, which a man found and hid, and joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. What's the treasure in the field? What's Jesus talking about? Let me give you some ideas from what the scripture teaches. Listen. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, says God, you'll be to me a special treasure above all people, for all the earth is mine. Israel is God's treasure. Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. You're a holy people to the Lord your God, for the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples. Psalm 135, verse 4. The Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, for his special treasure. The world is the field. But the treasure in that field is Israel. Jesus bought the world so he could get the hidden treasure, Israel. Sure, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him might not, have per- might not perish, but have eternal life. But Jesus wants us to know, is Israel rejected forever? Paul says no. They're the treasure in the field. The kingdom of God is like a man who finds treasure in a field. Sells everything so he can buy the field to get the treasure. Jesus says, note this. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now there's been one treasure on the land, the treasure in the field. This treasure is in the sea. And we know from the scriptures that whenever there's reference to the sea, it's always talking about the Gentile nations, the non-Israelite nations. There's a pearl coming out of the sea, says Jesus. And the fact that these two parables are virtually in the same breath indicates that Israel will exist and be hidden while the church would continue to grow. Yes, the pearl of great price is you. It's the church. The merchant is Jesus. He is the one looking for pearly treasure. And you know, I don't know if you know about pearls, I've done a little bit of research, it's so complicated, uh, it would take me ages to tell you all about it. But the bottom line is this, a pearl is formed when an organic substance irritates the mantle of a, a mollus. It hurts it. It harms it. Let me say that again. The reason a pearl is produced is because the oyster, the clam oyster, is hurt and harmed. So much so that it begins to overlay it with this thing called nacre. It covers it, building it up layer upon layer, so that that hurt and pain is acceptable to it. And that's what becomes a pearl, complete and intact. In the same way, we know that sin intruded upon Jesus on the cross. It was poured upon him. It was stuffed inside of him. It's only in the last 100 years that we've begun to cultivate pearls. And people that can do it properly earn a lot of money. And it's by making the minutest incision and inserting a foreign organic body in there that causes a pearl to grow. A spear pierced the side of Christ. And we, in our sinfulness, entered him through his open wounds. And his response was to put around us his white robe of righteousness. And in doing so, within himself, he formed the church. It's in Christ where our impurities are made pure. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. In Christ. The church is formed. 
out of Christ, the church comes. Just like the first Adam was anaesthetized by God, and from his side a rib was taken to form Isha, his wife, Eve. In the same way, out of the side of Christ, a pearl of great price was formed. Jesus sold everything that he had to gain the church. It was Frank Horton, inspired by Hudson Taylor of the China Inland Mission, editor of China's Millions, who became the Bishop of Sichuan. I pronounced that wrong, I know. He wrote that fantastic hymn. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake became as poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved courts for stable floor. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake became as poor. It cost Jesus everything to buy us And in love he made us pure. So much so, even in the new Jerusalem, you know what the gates of heaven are made of? Pearl. Jesus is the merchant man who paid his all for us. You are the pearl of great price. Jesus is the merchant who absolutely sacrificed everything to buy you. My dear friends, Jesus very quickly gives another parable, the parable of the dragnet, which we might look at tonight. I'm going to skip over that to verse 51, because Jesus now says to his disciples, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes, Lord, and I don't believe them. It's obvious of the questions they asked later on, they didn't really get it. But they kind of nodded their heads and said, as much as we can, Lord, we do. And so Jesus said this, every scribe, Instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Scribe is a teacher of righteousness, really born out of uh, the time of Ezra. Had great honour before they sunk into this, just this legalistic mess that there was in Israel at the time of Jesus. But they were teachers of righteousness. I'm a teacher of righteousness. It's my job. And do you know, my friends, it's my business, like it was the business of Jesus, to bring out treasure, both new and old. You are teachers of righteousness. It's also your business to bring out treasure, both new and old. Old Testament and New Testament. Tell me this morning in finishing, Grace, did you know you were that precious? That you were a pearl of great price. If your name's Margaret, or you've got a Margaret in your family line, that's a Greek for pearl. My mum's name, Margaret. And she was saved on her deathbed because she was a pearl of great price. Do you know that you're so precious? He bought you with a price. You are the Margarita of God. You need to make a list of your most prized possessions this week. All of your prized items. Take them to God the Holy Spirit for valuation. Take them to the Word for examination to see if they're truly valuable or if they're simply reproduction rubbish. Wood, hay and stubble overlaid with glitter. You see, did I tell you Jesus is not justifying or commenting The morality of smoke and mirrors of the treasure transaction or the the breath-holding haggling of deception. Jesus is talking about the passion of possession. And make no bones about it. The passion of possession has got its price. In 1942, Filipino diver removed a 14-pound pearl from a clam which was estimated to weigh over 150 pounds. A Palawan chieftain in that area held this giant pearl as one of his most treasured possessions. That is until the chief's son almost died and he was saved by an American man, Mr. William Dowell Cobb, to whom, in great appreciation, just two years after owning it, the chief happily gave the pearl. 
his second most precious possession. So thankful for the life of his son. Today in 2010, this same pearl, it's a freaky looking thing, isn't it? This same pearl is worth over 40 million dollars. 40 million dollars. That's how much the son of the Palawan chief was valued. To Jesus, we are the pearl of great price. To us, Jesus is the pearl of great price. In our lives today, how much do we value the son of the great chief himself? What value do we put on Jesus today? And how is this value marked in our life? My dear friends, let it be more than 30 pieces of silver. Please, don't betray him. There's a passion in possession, and possession has its price. Will you pay it? Jehovah Sabaoth, Lord of mighty host, God of angel armies, come and bring from coast to coast. Above our boasting needs, that heeds our great love. strike the raging waters. So, how about you then, dear friend? Are you willing to pay the price of following Jesus with all of your head, with all of your heart, with all of your soul? Of the 66 Books Ministry, we pray that you will. Count the cost then. He's worth it, you know. He's really worth it. Just to remind you that the 66 Books Ministry is a global city missions organization concerned with one thing only and that is to proclaim both the message and the person of Jesus from every book of the Holy Bible. If you want to be a partner with us in this, then please contact us directly through www.the66booksministry.com or write to us at 96 Craig Street, Suite 166, Ella J, Georgia, 30540 or call us toll free on 855-66-BOOKS. That's 855 855- 662-6657. Thank you, and God bless you. Close my Savior, sweet Lord Jesus. Close the blessed paraclete. Let me hear thy voice behind me. Guide, direct. What love, I wish I knew it, oh, the well so deep, 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 oh, to drink of that rich vintage, and fill my nights with praising sleep, when the Scales I see when the darkness it surrounds me. This is what I cry to thee. Oh, what love! I wish I knew it. Oh, the well so deep. Oh, to drink of that rich vintage and fill my night with praising
Oh, what love I wish I knew it. Oh, the well so deep, deep, deep. Oh, to drink of that rich vintage and fill my nights with praising sleep. Oh, what love I wish I knew it Oh, the well so deep, deep, deep Oh, to drink of that rich vintage And fill my nights with praising sleep Fill my nights with praising sleep Our vision is to take the gospel of Jesus to the 66 most influential cities of the 250 nations of the world. That's 16,500 cities. Want to help? Then go to give66.com.